Christian faith, of course, our job as churches is to accompany young people of all kinds and to let them know, you know, you're beautiful the way you are. God loves you the way you are. God made you in God's own image and likeness. Not just because you're brown, not because if you speak this language or that language, not if you assimilate to this or that, the way you are. But that's one of the first things the gospel preaches and one of the last things every one of us believes. Well, hey, everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological complexity. Today, we're tackling a really fun topic. And it came to me as I was looking at Hispanic Heritage Month and realizing, man, this is something I would love to be able to bring into the conversations that I'm having here on the channel. How can we unite those two things? Because the history of Christianity in the U.S. has so much to do with Hispanics and Latinos, but it's not something that often gets talked about. And so that's what we're doing in this episode. I'm joined by Dr. Timothy Matavina as we explore the history of Catholicism and Christianity in the U.S., as well as the state of the Catholic Church today and the incredibly important role of Latino Catholics and what that all means, what that looks like, what are some of the unique flavors of Latino Catholicism. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's something a bit different, but really interesting stuff. So before we get into it, I just want to say a quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my patrons who give monthly to help this channel keep going and growing. Thank you all so much. If you would like to help support this channel and get a lot of cool perks in doing so, like early access to interviews, uh, exclusive access to academic content, you'll be able to watch these all ad-free, stuff like that, get merch, discounts, all that kind of stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity, or if you'd like to make a one-time donation to the channel, you can go to paypal.me slash gospel simplicity. Thank you all so much for your support. And with all that being said, here's the video. Today, I am joined by Dr. Timothy Madavina. Dr. Timothy Madavina holds a PhD from the Catholic University of America and is a professor at the University of Notre Dame. He works in the area of faith and culture with specialization in U.S. Catholic and U.S. Latino theology and religion. Professor Madavina, Ma Madavina has authored over 150 essays and reviews in scholarly and opinion journals. He has also written or edited 20 books, most recently Latino Catholicism. In addition to his scholarly work, Dr. Madavina offers presentations and workshops on U.S. Catholicism and Latino ministry and theology throughout the United States. Dr. Madavina, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Austin. It's great to be with you and with the others who will be watching. Yes, this is a pleasure. And, you know, the idea for this interview came up as uh, Hispanic Heritage Month was coming up. And I was thinking about just the, the huge role that uh, Latinos play in U.S. Catholicism. But it wasn't something I've been able to talk about on my channel. And I came across your work and thought, man, I would love to get to talk to him about that and be able to explore this with my guests who maybe haven't thought of it also uh, as I haven't as a whole great uh, deal. So I'm excited to do this. And I'd love to know what initially interested you in not only studying, but also being involved in uh, the Hispanic Catholic community. Well, Austin, I was kind of like the way you just described yourself and others. You know, I sort of knew that there were Latinos who are Catholic and Protestant and of various backgrounds, um, but I hadn't had a lot of an involvement when I was doing a master's degree, I was actually studying in Canada and they had a program where you could come back and, and study in San Antonio, Texas for a semester. So I was actually a foreign exchange student back to my own country because I'm from I'm from the United States. And a friend said, let's do it. And really, it was kind of on a whim. You know, God works beautiful ways in your life. Uh, you know, it really, I thought, well, it's cold up here. It's the, it's the winter semester. I'll, I'll go to San Antonio and try it out. That was almost 40 years ago. It'll be 40 years ago next January. And I've been doing this ever since. I just fell in love with the devotion, the spirit, the prayer life, uh, the activism, the faith-based activism, and so many other aspects of Latino Catholicism. It so enriched my own faith journey. And so I've been involved with it ever since. Wow, that is amazing how God can work through something as simple as a little change of scenery or weather. Um, and that's that's really yes. neat to hear, yes. to be able to look back on that. That's awesome. Well, you know, at the beginning of your book, Latino Catholicism, which I would recommend, and I'll be linking in the description uh, down below if people want to check that out, you write that without Latino Catholics, Catholicism in the U.S. would be declining as rapidly as mainline denominations, which is to say quite rapidly. Could you elaborate this on this a bit, kind of fleshing out the central place of Latino Catholics in terms of the Catholic demographic in America? Yes, a common statistic is uh, 
over 70 percent of the growth because in terms of numbers the catholic church is still growing in this country but over 70 percent of the growth since 1960 is driven by the presence of hispanic latinx latino catholics now that can be a little misleading in a certain way because some of your viewers may be aware a lot of latinos are now involved in in other christian groups especially pentecostals and evangelicals and the percentage of Latinos in the United States who are Catholic has actually gone down. So it, this is actually what we call a shrink while we're growing phenomenon. The percentage of Latinos who are Catholic is actually somewhat less. It's down below 60% now. But it's because there are so many more Latinos, the, the pie is bigger. And so though the percentage is less, the raw number is greater. So shrink while you're growing, uh, like many other Christian denominations, you know, there's 25 percent of the young people or the, or the people in the United States now claim no religion. And Latinos actually very surprising to me. I never would have predicted this 30, 40 years ago that Latinos would at a, an opinion poll basically arise to the national average and say 25 percent would say I, I have no religion. It doesn't mean they're atheists. It doesn't mean that they don't believe in God or have a spirituality. It means they're not involved in a church, a particular you know religious expression. That wasn't the case years ago, uh, but it, it certainly has happened. There's a lot of changing demographics among young people. Um, Pentecostals, evangelicals, about 20, 22, 23 percent of Latinos now are in those churches, but they also lose members among Latinos and other groups. You know, there, there's nothing permanent there. Uh, but in terms of the Catholic Church, even though the percentage of Latinos is, who are Catholic has gone down, the number has gone up because there's so many more Latinos. Uh, and that's not driven primarily by immigration. There's still a lot of immigrants. But it's the growth, the population growth now is now primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in the children of immigrants, the grandchildren of immigrants. You know, most Latinos are born in the United States. They're not only 30 percent are immigrants. So the the children and grandchildren of those who did immigrate in the 90s and, you know, uh, that's what's driving the population growth. And um, if it weren't for that, the Catholic Church would probably be diminishing in numbers because Latinos are what's keeping the numbers what they were and even driving them up higher. So that's that's the point, you know, I, I don't think it's the only point. I, I will say on page one of the book, I was very determined to get this on page one of the book, Latinos do not just matter because of the numbers. They matter for many, many other reasons. But the numbers, of course, are, as you point out, that's the place to start. And uh, that, that's an important part of the dynamics of what's going on in the Catholic Church, what's going on in other churches, what's going on in the United States more broadly. Yeah, and I love how you did put that on page one, and I hope that this interview can reflect that, not just the demographic or the numbers, but to really get at kind of the, the heart of Latino Catholicism, what's going on there, and how uh, people can just get a better understanding of what is such a large part of the Catholic Church in America. And I think one way to do that is to get a little bit at the history of it here. And in your book, you kind of start by going through some of the history of Latino Catholicism in the United States. And I found a lot of the points really interesting. Um, we'll only be able to get to a few of them. Uh, but while I must admit that I've often shared the perception uh, that you speak about in the book of American Catholicism being kind of a white middle class religion and the state and you know D.C. suburbs that I grew up in, uh, the state of Maryland and kind of the D.C. suburbs, that was what I saw. Um, but you recall, you call readers to look afresh at the fact that the origins of Catholicism in America are Hispanic. Could you walk us through that a bit? Oh, thank Austin. Yeah, and that, that's a good point and a good good topic. Well, actually, the origins of Christianity, more broadly, not just Catholicism in the United States, are Latino. The first permanent settlement in what's now the continental United States was in St. Augustine, Florida, which was 50 years before Plymouth Rock and well before Jamestown, the first British colony. If we count Puerto Rico, which is a commonwealth of the United States, a possession of the United States now. There actually was a Catholic, Catholic bishop in a diocese there a century before Jamestown. So the first Christians in what's now the United States of America were Latino Catholics. Um, so it's just kind of an origin story. Maybe a little uh, humorous anecdote will help bring that home. You know, the, the first permanent settlement in what's now the Southwest was in El Paso, Texas. 
And that is about 10 years before Jamestown and over 20 years before Plymouth Rock. So uh, the people who, the Catholics, Spanish speaking Catholics who arrived in El Paso and founded that first settlement, they were part of an expedition that crossed the Chihuahua Desert, very dangerous, of course, to cross on foot back in those days. And when they reached El Paso, they had a mass of Thanksgiving in which they gathered with local indigenous peoples and celebrated that they had made it to this place. So they have always claimed that that first Catholic mass celebrated in El Paso was actually the first Thanksgiving in the United States. It's, it's kind of a point of pride for people in El Paso. It's on April the 3rd or usually they celebrate it around then, but that's the day. So a few years ago, 20, 30 years ago, they did this sort of mock lawsuit. I mean, this was all done for publicity on both sides, but the El Pasoans sent a delegation to Plymouth in November for, for our Thanksgiving day. And they did this, and again, this was a publicity stunt, this wasn't real, but they sort of, they sued the the, the pilgrims and their descendants for having falsely claimed to have celebrated the first Christian Thanksgiving in the United States. And it went to court, you know, like they had a, like a court scene and it was just kind of, again, this publicity stunt sort of a thing. Well, the court, which was comprised of people from, from the Pilgrims side of things, they ruled in favor of the El Pasoans. And the, the sentence was they ordered a delegation of the, of the Pilgrims that from, you know, from what, who our Thanksgiving descends to go to El Paso the following April and to publicly admit that that was the real origins of the Thanksgiving in the United States and celebrate with them. So again, this was really meant to just draw attention to both communities, but it underscores in a sort of a humorous way, a contemporary way, the fact that Latinos have been here from the beginning. Now, a little more seriously, it's not just a matter of bragging about who was here first. I mean, I, I guess that that means something, but more importantly, how do we think about the origins of our history of this country? Most of us were trained in school, and rightly, I'm not saying any of this is wrong, but we were trained to think about the 13 British colonies as the founding of the country, the, the American Revolution, and then the westward movement of peoples that settled and brought the, the flag of the United States all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And of course, that's, that's true. It's true when, we, when we're talking about the history of the historical boundaries of the United States and when it expanded. But if you're doing a Catholic history of the United States or a Christian history or a religious history or really any history, the history of a place does not begin when the United States gets there and puts up its flag. Certainly Christian history begins when the name of Jesus Christ is first proclaimed in a particular place, no matter which country happens to be in control at the time. So if we look at the lands now part of the United States of America, and we want to ask, what's the history of Catholicism? What's the history of Christianity? We necessarily have to begin before the Declaration of Independence. We have to begin with the arrival of the first Christians, the attempt to convert native peoples, which happened more among the Catholics than the Protestants, but it did. Ha it happened in the Northeast too. There was, you know, Jonathan Edwards and some of the famous pilgrim preachers, there was some mission work among natives to try to bring them to Christianity. Uh, and so we have to look at it that way. And when we look at it that way, the whole lens through which we see the history changes. It's not just 13 colonies in the westward movement of peoples, because you got the British starting the 13 colonies and moving westward. You've got the Spanish moving in from the south and moving northward. And actually, you also have the French, who also founded their first settlement in what's now Maine before Jamestown. And the French, of course, were more in Canada, but you got the French moving from the north and coming southward. And the history of Christianity, Catholicism and Protestantism, and what's now the United States, is these three flows of Christians that were the colonizing forces moving in varying directions, encountering and conflicting with one another. You know, there were wars between the various countries, but nonetheless, both the French and the Spanish founded settlements that are still with us today. All the French names you found around here, like Vincennes, Detroit, and certainly the Spanish place names from Florida all the way to California, remind us that there were other Christian peoples starting uh, those settlements before they became part of the United States. 
And more than that, of course, it's not just the French, the Spanish, and the British. There were many native peoples already on the land who are um, a horrific part of this story. We just had, you know, um, uh, Indigenous Heritage Day the other day, uh, but they were there before any of these people came and became in many ways, very tragic ways often part of the story, but some of them also entered into Christianity. And then beyond that, there's also the African slaves who were brought, who from the very beginning were part of this story. Many of them also became Christians. Uh, they even started their own Christian denominations. Many of them became Catholic. There's 3 million African-American, African Catholics in the United States now. That's often not known either. There's a huge number of African descent people who are Roman Catholic in this country. So it was not the history of the United States and the history of Christianity in the United States was not just the westward movement of peoples. It was three imperial powers, each vying for control, setting down settlements of their, you know, and bringing Christianity, encountering and conflicting with one another, and then the mixing in of the indigenous and African peoples, and then also the European and Asian immigrants who came as well and formed part of this, you know, huge nation of Mitch mixed multicultural and multiracial uh, uh, peoples. Uh, and that's the story of Christianity. So when we talk about Latino Catholicism being first, it's something more than just bragging rights. It's a way of reconsidering what is the United States and what is Christianity in the United States? What, what are its origins and how has it developed? I'll just give one practical example. And forgive me, Austin, I'm really doing this to your readers, but I'm talking to you, so I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Um, what is the first town, became a city, found in what's now the United States, where more than half the original settlers were of African heritage, at least partially African heritage? The first U.S. city in which at least half of the inhabitants were African descent. Is that is that the question? Had some, had some African descent, and I'm talking about the founding, the founding settlers, the ones that were there the day they said, "This is now a town." Oof, I don't think I can answer that. It would be a guess at best. Okay, well, we'll uh, we'll let your uh, viewers also guess. They've had a chance to guess now. The answer is Los Angeles, hmm. Los Angeles, California. If you go to La Placita, the original founding plaza of Los Angeles, there's a plaque there that has the names of what was called the Primer Pobladores, the, the founding settlers. And they were a very racialized society, you know, the Spanish speaking conquistadores, they weren't the only ones, but they were. So they kept rather um, detailed records of the racial backgrounds. And of course, Los Angeles was founded on the northern edge of New Spain at the time it was founded. And most of the Spaniards, that is the white European folks, they didn't venture out to the northern hinterlands. They stayed in Mexico City and, and headquarters. The people who went out were usually people of mixed race, people of color. And there was only a few actual people who were 100% African in that group. But there were mulatos, people of mixed white and black, you know, mixed race people. And, and others who were at least one fourth or partly African so that more than half of the Primer Pobladores, the founding uh, settlers of what's now Los Angeles, California, were Spanish-speaking Catholics, but more than half of them with at least some African heritage uh, in their background. So that's the story of the United States. And when we, when we take these colonial um, elements more seriously, we begin to understand more, you know, the mixing of cultures and the cultural variety. This is not a new phenomenon. It's been, it's the very foundations of what's now the United States of America. Usually when we think of Latinos, we think of recent immigrants, and there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of Latinos are recent immigrants. The majority, you know, the majority have come in the last hundred years, and then their children born here. But of course, Latinos have been here all along from the very, very beginning of what, you know, when this country was founded. The most forgotten story of Latino history, the origins are often forgotten. The other forgotten piece is, when the United States moved westward, half of what was Mexico became part of the United States. Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, California. Uh, that, of course, was in a war or precipitated 
actually precipitated by the United States. Mexico did not want to go to war, but the United States started this war. And so all of those Latinos, the first large group of Latinos that were actually in the boundaries of the United States were not immigrants. They didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. They were conquered into uh, the country and, be, and, and, you know, and, and kind of suffered a lot because of it, because they were thought to be very second class and, and treated poorly because you know, they had been conquered in and well, they were, they were mixed race people. There was still very, I mean, there was very bad racism and so on. But that's another part of the story, the conquered Latinos of the Southwest. That's the first large group of Latinos to be part of what's now the United States with all the ramifications of being a conquered people uh, has, uh, including how it affected, you know, their, their Catholicism became a real source of strength and dignity because they still had their God and they still had, and, you know, in the case of our Catholic peoples, the Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe as their protector and their, their, their caretaker and watcher. Well, there's a lot more, but I think that's enough for that for that question, Austin. Thank you. Hey, we'll be right back to the interview. But first, I want to tell you about another sponsor for today, and that is Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors that exist to help you get the help you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was called You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. And what I wanted to do in that video was draw out the fact that so many people are struggling with mental health. And the last thing we want to do is make it more difficult for people to reach out to get the help they need by creating this stigma around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about and think we need to end in Christian circles. And that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling. Their counselors all will be counseling from a Christian perspective. And you can connect with them from any country in the world. They have counselors that speak many different languages. And hey, if you, it's important to you to have a counselor from your specific tradition or background, they can do their part to try to pair you up with one of them as well. All of their counselors are licensed with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with these counselors in a variety of ways. Four, in fact. You can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, or messaging. All of the messaging is secure. And if it's between scheduled ses sessions, you will receive a response within 24 to 48 hours. If this is interesting to you, if you think this would be helpful for you or maybe a loved one, I'd encourage you to go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, first of all, you'll get 10% off your order and you'll be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours. Hours. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity to be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours and get 10% off your first month. Faithful counseling costs $260 per month, which gets you unlimited messaging with your counselor and four 30 minute sessions. But again, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, you'll get 10% off that first month. Lastly, Faithful Counseling is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line or hotline. You can find one of them at www.crisistextline.org. Please do so. You can reach out. You do not have to do this alone. Well, thank you all so much, and I will let you get back to the video, but if you want to check them out, again, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. The link is in my bio and in the pinned comment. Well, back to the interview. Oh, thank you. That was fascinating, and I really appreciate the opportunity to look at U.S. history through the lens of the expansion of Christianity and Catholicism, not just in who was here first, but how that all worked out and kind of reframing what we usually think of as kind of our history being solely this thing of the 13 colonies out in the eastern part of the U.S. where it's where I'm from and just kind of seeing expansion that way, but also seeing all the different uh, forces that were at play there. I think that's really fascinating. I hope people take some time to think about that and I'll, just to whet their appetites, I'll let them know that there'll be some upcoming videos um, both on uh, one on uh, Nicholas the Black Elk um, and talking about yeah um, Native American and Catholic um, engagement there as well as one on the veneration of black saints in uh, slave communities in the U.S., which I think people will really enjoy on that. So some things happening there. But speaking of kind of the groups that sometimes we forget uh, historically in these conversations, uh, one point you raise in discussing American Catholicism's Hispanic roots is that that really caught my attention was the prominent role of women, specifically what you call the matriarchal core of Hispanic Catholicism. Could you share a bit about that? Sure. Uh, that turn of phrase comes from a uh, 
Puerto Rican scholar of religion, Ana Maria Diaz Stevens, who, who works uh, out of North New York. Uh, and she's done a lot of studies of the role of women in colonial societies in Latin America and coming forward to, to our very day, you know. And, and the idea is, is this, you know, of course, Catholicism, women cannot be ordained priests. Women don't hold the role of bishops. And so it's often thought of, well, that's a religion, you know, kind of run by men because the men are the ones that celebrate the sacraments and have the Episcopal hierarchical positions and so on. And certainly that that's a true element of Catholicism. On the other hand, in local communities at the at the grassroots level, very often the one who is turned to for advice uh, in times of tragedy, in times of need, it's often the mother uh, who is, um, you know, the mother or a female leader who is kind of guiding the community along. In many places throughout Latin America, and indeed in what's now the Southwest United States, going back into colonial times, there wasn't always enough priests to have a priest in every little village and town. And so the priest might just visit every now and then. And in that leadership sort of vacuum of a clergy member present, uh, often it was women who then would lead the weekly worship, uh, who would pray for healing, who would pray for the dead, uh, who would train young people in the faith. Now, I hesitate to add, this doesn't mean that lay men, men who aren't priests, didn't do anything. Uh, there's a tendency now to sort of think, well, religion, uh, teaching children their prayers, that's a woman's job. Uh, I, I don't want to fall into that stereotype, um, especially when we look back further into history. Uh, we, we do see more male leadership on the lay side. The idea that men are, you know, women go to church and men don't as much, which is sociologically true, not just among Latinos. I mean, it's not entirely, you know, it's not every man, but percentage basis. You see more women in church than in men. You see more in, in a Spanish mass in the United States, usually wherever I've gone around the country, you'll often see more women than men, women and children. So I, I don't want to make it sound like this all equal. But in the past, you, historically, this greater disparity between the number of men and women wasn't, wasn't, as, wasn't as great. Nonetheless, uh, in many places, even when there were clergy and often especially when there was not, women came forward and despite the fact that you can't be ordained a priest as a woman in the Catholic church, they were functioning very much in leadership roles, the kind of role a priest would have, being the community leader of prayer, of giving counsel, uh, of guiding folks forward and so on. So that's kind of the matriarchal core um, that uh, Professor Dia Stevens talked about in her overall analysis of women in Latino Catholicism. Interesting. Thank you for that. And I think it's just interesting to be able to kind of flesh out what that might have looked like as we talk about history there. But I want to transition a bit now to talk a bit more modern day now that we've gotten uh, at least our feet wet in some of the history of Latino Catholicism. And, um, you know, I find that at least in the circles that I run in, it is still primarily white middle class Catholics that have the largest platforms, at least where I kind of situate myself in YouTube, the people, the voices I see elevated, the authors that I, I come across. Um, and so I'd love to help my audience explore some of the, the key elements of Latino Catholicism that maybe they're just not familiar with. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to talk about is this tension that you draw out in your book uh, really well between assimilation and integration. You write, and I think it's worth uh, quoting here, that the challenge of forging unity among such a diverse ecclesial body is more acute than ever. Central to this challenge is the hotly debated question of whether Latinos will or should adopt the language and culture of the United States. So for people that just aren't familiar with kind of this tension in this conversation that's going on, what are what is this tension between assimilation and um, integration that's going on? Well, that's a rich question with with many, many aspects and um, and and you know complications. So let me just give a few basic points to start. Well, one is the word assimilation is often used by bishops, by Latinos themselves in a kind of a negative way. It's sort of putting behind your own identity, sort of renouncing your, your, your country, your language, your culture of heritage, and to become more like white America. So it's kind of a renunciation of where you've come from. 
which really is almost like cultural schizophrenia. So that's that's word is it can have it can have different meanings. It's not necessarily a negative word, but in these conversations, assimilation is usually used as the negative pole of the debate. Integration is an appreciation of the United States and a desire to become a fully participating member of the church and society here, but without also losing at the same time the valuable traditions, the valuable cultural aspects of where one came from. So you integrate, you, know, not, you, don't, you don't renounce the United States, but you bring yourself into it and you bring the best of both worlds. I mean, that would be the ideal. Uh, there are some, now let's talk about wh what is actually happening. So that's sort of the idea or the ideals that are fostered or discussed, debated. There are some that say, well, Latinos are unlike previous immigrant groups. They do not assimilate. They do not integrate. They don't do one or the other. They kind of maintain a cultural enclave and they just keep speaking Spanish and they won't become part of the larger culture. They won't come to the larger body politic. That's an accusation that's been made that Hispanics are not like other groups. Um, I do not agree with that at all. And I, I don't think it reflects reality. I, I just don't know where those people are coming from. In the second generation of Latinos, 96, 97% speak English fluently. I mean, you can't go to school in this country w without learning English, at least somewhat. Um, and by the third generation, many Latinos don't speak Spanish anymore. I mean, they're, they're kind of just like the Italians and the Germans and the Poles and all the people that, that you might know from the Northeast of those backgrounds. What, what, ha what happened with our ancestors, you know, over, over generations? And so they do adapt in various ways to life in the United States. In fact, sometimes the problem or the concern is young Latinos adapt too much to the United States. Now, there's a thing called the immigrant paradox. This is something that sociologists have been talking about for quite a while now. The immigrant paradox is this. We all believe, I mean, it certainly was the case in my family. I'm Irish and Croatian. The United States is a land of opportunity. First generation comes, a lot of them are hard working class people. Second generation gets some more education. By the third generation, you have the first college graduate. You know, in fact, one of the things that I look at for my children and your generation, Austin, is, you know, my generation, the baby boomers, we were part of an unprecedented economic growth and educational opportunity from our parents' generation to our generation. And one of the fears I have is what are we handing on to your generation? You know, economic opportunity is growing for some, but that number is smaller now. And there's a large middle of younger people who even come out with a college degree and they don't feel they have the same opportunities that they maybe their parents had and so on. So, you know, things are changing uh, quite a bit. And the immigrant paradox is this, you know, the belief is that in America, it's a land of opportunity. Each successive generation does better than the previous generation. You know, there's a constant upward linear line of progress. Well, I'm not even sure that's true for the descendants of Europeans anymore, but it's certainly not true across the board for Latinos, where in fact, on a variety of health indicators, the second and the third generation do worse than their parents. And the great paradox is this, say the parents come and parents you know, are immigrants. Some of them don't even have legal documents to be in this country. As such, they don't have access to health care. They usually don't have a, the same level of education as their children are going to get. They don't have the same access to healthy food. You know, they don't have the same economic and a whole range of factors. There are things that would predict oh, the parents aren't going to have the same life expectancy, you know, the same health, uh, robust health as their children who then, you know, get it at least into public schools. Some of them get a chance to go to college. They do, if they're born in the United States, they have access to some form of health care. It might be, you know, not, not be the greatest, but they have something, school lunches. On a whole host of indicators, you would think these children are going to do better than the parents. But on the national average, they do not. Their life expectancy is lower. The, the, the possibility of them getting involved in alcohol and drug addiction, teenage pregnancy, 
and a whole host of other things that are, you know, that can lead to can can lead to lower quality of life. They all increase. And um, so the immigrant paradox is this. Why is it that sociologically the immigrant generation of Latinos against all expectations and against all odds actually does better on the whole than the next generation? Now, again, that's not case by case. We have some I don't want to make another stereotype about young Latinos, young Latinos, your age, Latinos and Latinas. They are many of them doing very well. Only 3% of them are in gangs. If you watch television shows, you'd think 97% were in gangs. It's just the opposite. These are hardworking, dedicated, many of them successful young people. Many of them are getting college educated. Many of them are becoming professionals. So you know, I don't want to reinforce the stereotype that young Latinos are all doing badly. But statistically, when you take the whole group, according to these sociological studies, their life expectancy is exactly slightly less than their parents and uh, other indicators are not doing as well. And why is that? Back to your question, because they sometimes young people assimilate the worst aspects of the United States. You know, my wife for many years, she just retired. She was a bilingual teacher in the South Bend schools where we live. And really it breaks your heart. The stories I've heard her tell over the years of families who come, fairly recent immigrants, send their children to the public schools, and they come to the first parent-teacher night a few months later, and they're saying, well, we don't understand what's going on with our children. Our children come home from school, and they talk back to their elders. They're disrespectful, and they, they won't kind of, you know, you tell them to do their homework, and they tell you that they're going to do it later, or they don't want to do it. You know, they're kind of arrogant and talking back. And we don't know where they're learning this. Well, it's no mystery to my wife. She says, well, I'm sorry, you know, we're doing the best we can over here, but they learn it in the school. You know, they come from Mexico or the other countries of Latin America with a deep culture of respect for elders. Not that there's no problems in those countries, there's problem everywhere, but there is a deep kind of sense of respect of elders, respect of yourself, respect of life. And young people who come to this country can get caught up in the wrong group of U.S. American young people and end up learning exactly the wrong things. And so uh, assimilation can be a very, very negative thing. The ideal, of course, is to take the best of you have of your own cultural heritage and the best that this nation, with all of its strengths, has to offer. And we have many young Latinos that do that, that are kind of bicultural and they can function in both languages and both worlds, and they bring in beautiful traits from both of them. Unfortunately, with racism and many of the other pressures of life, sometimes they're more tempted to take some of the worst aspects of both cultures. And sometimes they just feel lost because when they go, say, back to Mexico, they're, oh, you're American now. Even the way you speak Spanish, if you're raised here and you do speak Spanish, they'll kind of know, well, you're not from here. And then among their white friends, they're always trying to have to prove themselves because they look Latino, they look Mexican. And so being caught in between two cultures can be a tremendous kind of pressure and struggle for a young person who just doesn't quite know where they belong. I mean, that, that's true of all young people, you know, all young people. Where do I belong? Where do I fit? Where, where am I loved? Who, who are the people that care about me? We all think about that. Maybe young people more than older people like me. But when you're between cultures, it just adds to the depth of the struggle and th this debate about assimilation and integration. And that's where it really hits on the pain of human experience, the daily experience of people who just kind of, well, do I belong over here? Do I belong over there? Where am I going to fit? Where am I going to go? And, you know, among young Latinos, they, they will pursue that in their own ways. Some of them prefer to be in a largely Spanish speaking environment some more in a largely English-speaking environment with their new friends. Some go back and forth and kind of live a bi bicultural reality. Uh, you know, it just depends on how they're trying to make their life work. Christian faith, of course, our job as churches is to accompany young people of all kinds and to let them know, you know, you're beautiful the way you are. God loves you the way you are. God made you in God's own image and likeness. Not just because you're brown, not because if you speak this language or that language, not if you assimilate to this or that the way you are. But that's one of the first things the gospel preaches and one of the last things every one of us believes. You know, it's easy for me to believe 
Oh, Austin, God loves you the way you are. I don't know you well, but I'm already starting to like you. Uh, God loves you the way you are. But that's not the challenge of Christianity. The challenge of Christianity is, does God love me, Tim, the way I am? Seeing all the things that I know are, are wrong with me. And for a young person who's getting a lot of negative messages, I think social media even amplifies the number of negative messages that a young person can get. Boy, just receiving that basic gospel is, is so difficult. That's the challenge today. These young people who are in between integration, assimilation, all that stuff. How does the church walk with young people and really help them to really feel in their own heart and bones and souls? You know, Jesus would have died in that cross just for me. He'd have done it if I was the only one. That's how much I'm loved. Easy to say, hard to truly believe. Wow, that was powerful. I love the way you put that that turn of phrase there. That it's the first you know, that that you were loved and made in the image of God uh, it is the first one of the first things the gospel preaches, and one of the last we often believe. That's and I, I think if people walked away with like that ten second clip of this interview, their hour of time would have been worth it already. But there has been so much here, and just thank you for personalizing that question, not just in kind of like this abstract the, theoretical level, but what what is the the, the plight of young people today trying to sort through uh, mixtures of culture and I identity and all these things. I really, really mm. appreciated that. Um, I could talk about that for an hour, but I want to pivot to another, what I think is a, a really interesting and important topic around Latino Catholicism, and that is the prevalence of charismatic uh, Catholicism in these populations, which I remember when I first heard about charismatic Catholicism that I, I was kind of confused. I, I almost saw that as like a contradiction in terms in a way. I, I had a picture of what charismatics, uh, charismatic worship looked like and a picture of what c Catholic worship looked like. And I was just surprised to see those things uh, mm -hmm. go together. So I know this is a huge topic of conversation, um, but just for those that aren't familiar, could you talk about the role of charismatic Catholicism in Latino communities? Sure. Um, well, I'm at the University of Notre Dame and actually... The charismatic movement within Catholicism began um, not solely at Notre Dame, but it was one of the founding places back in 1967 after the Second Vatican Council. Duquesne University was also very important. So this is a, you know, for people who are watching that don't know it, this is, you know, something that you normally would think if you're thinking about Pentecostal expressions of Christianity, uh, not Catholic or Episcopalian or others, because the charismatic re renewal is among other Protestant groups, too, that are. Um, you know, based on sacraments and other sorts of expressions of the faith. Uh, so it's been around a, a good while, but it started mainly among white English speaking Catholics. In the 90s or so, it started to shift more to where now three quarters of the charismatic Catholics in the world, because it's an ivory continent now, uh, are in Latin America. And by some estimates, I don't know how exactly this is counted, but by some estimates, there are more Latinos in the United States who are Catholic charismatics than there are Latinos who are Pentecostals. I mean, it's, I, I don't know, there are different uh, estimates of that. So, I, but that's one of them. It, it, it may be a little off, but anyways, it at least creates the, the right impression. This is a huge thing. The largest apostolic movement among Latinos in the Catholic Church in the United States today is the charismatic renewal. Prayer groups, large groups, large group meetings and so on. A good friend of mine, uh, Andres, is, uh, is on the International Commission of Charismatic Catholics with Pope Francis. So this young, this Latino guy in, in uh, Camden, New Jersey, uh, he's on that thing. So it's, it's very large. And why is that? Well, Latinos have always had a very expressive form of Catholicism. You know, they do pilgrimages. They have big devotions. They pray in very embodied ways. They don't just sit and fold their hands and do mental prayer. It's the whole body in prayer, you know, and, and the charismatic expressions, you know, raising your hand in praise, uh, even speaking in tongues, giving witness. This speaks very deeply to people, uh, to immigrant people who have suffered a lot, to give a testimony that says, well, you know, you know the Lord has helped me in this way and that way. That just speaks right to the heart. Catholics... Catholic parishes are more and more, they're larger in numbers than they used to be. And that can be kind of impersonal. You know, you go to church on Sunday and there's a large group of people there and you may not even know the person sitting next to you. Whereas when you go to a prayer group, it's kind of like going to a small Pentecostal storefront church. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, on a kind of a social dynamic, 
it's not surprising at all. The same things that attract people, Latinos and others, to Pentecostal churches attracts them to charismatic prayer groups. Personalism, preaching, acts, direct access to the Bible, prayers for healing, uh, experiences of healing, miraculous experiences of healing and so on. Um, so uh, I'm not surprised at all. The prayers for healing long before the charismatic renewal were deeply embedded in Latino Catholicism, faith healer prayers and so on within Catholicism. And so that expressive, embodied, deeply communal, witness-oriented style of being Catholic has been there for a while. And this is in some ways just the latest iteration of it. But it's very important. In many dioceses, and many parishes, the leadership is kind of driven by charismatic renewal uh, leaders. Not everywhere. In some dioceses, it's hardly existed at all. But in other places, it's, it's kind of like the main game in town, if you will, um, and seems to be growing. It seems to be growing. It really speaks to people. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it's interesting how it's pervaded different Christian groups, not just, say, in like what you traditionally think of as Pentecostal movements, um, but within Catholic, Episcopalian, all of these other uh, groups. And it was interesting to hear some of the history of that. I actually wasn't familiar uh, with Notre Dame's role in the kind of start there in, in the 60s and then in the 90s there. Um, so really interesting stuff. I appreciate that. Um, this is, this is honestly probably rude to do to you with what, like 14 minutes left to ask you a question. I know you're so passionate about, uh, but the final thing I'd like, uh, to talk about, at least in terms of kind of uniqueness of Latino Catholicism is, uh, just the regards to devotional practices, specifically the, uh, the high level of devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, I know you have an entire book on this, um, but in brief, could you, res uh, could you just kind of explain, a bit of the Guadalupan devotion uh, in Lat Latino Catholicism and just kind of how that flavors uh, Latino Catholicism. Wow. First, I, I, a little uh, lead up to that. We haven't said this yet. There's 22 countries in the world where Spanish is a primary language. The United States is the second largest Spanish speaking country in the world. And every one of them has their own image of the Virgin Mary in Catholicism. So Guadalupe is the patroness of the Americas, of America, the entire hemisphere. She's certainly the most widely, you know, venerated one in this country because two thirds of Latinos in this country are of Mexican origin. But, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Cuba, th they all have their own images of Mary. And I, I don't want to be leaving any of them out. Each of them would have their own feast day, their own national devotion. Some of them are also devotees of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Some Latinos have not really heard that much about Our Lady of Guadalupe. So, uh, you know, I want to honor all those other images of the Virgin Mary. Uh, in some parishes I've been, we've had processions, and each group would bring their own version of Mary. and We'd share them all together, and it was very beautiful, kind of a real international, global celebration that Mary is the mother of everybody. Um, secondly, I, I want to make a little comment about maybe some of your viewers are not Catholic. And sometimes people who aren't Catholic, they want to know, well, what's all this stuff about Mary and the Catholic Church? Um, my, a good friend of mine once was asked, giving a talk to uh, campus ministry, I think at Yale, but someplace he was giving a talk. And, and they, he was a priest. And they asked him afterwards, well, you know, um, do, uh, do Catholics, you know, who, who do they love more? Or uh, he was asked this, is Mary necessary for salvation? Do Catholics believe Mary is necessary for salvation? And he said, no, you know, that's not, if you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Jesus Christ is solely, you know, his death on the cross and resurrection, that's the source of salvation. Mary is not necessary for salvation. And that's why we love her so much. And they said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, you think about it. When you love someone, do you just give them what's necessary? If you fall in love with a, you know, with someone that you fall in love with, do you then tell them, oh, I'm in love with you. I'm going to give you what's necessary. Here's a house and sufficient food to eat. And there, I've given you what's necessary. There, I love you. Well, no, of course, love is what you want to express above and, be, above and beyond what's necessary. You know, you want to give them a diamond ring or you want to give a trip or, or some other thing that you know is very precious to them. It may not be expensive, but it still might be a precious sort of a thing. But it's precisely an expression of love because it's not necessary. And that's how we look at the Virgin Mary. God didn't, she is not necessary for salvation. God did not have to give us her. Christ was necessary. 
His mother was not. And yet it seems like, at least this is the way we take it as Catholics, God didn't want to just do what was necessary for our salvation. God loved us so much, it just started overflowing. And he said, here, this is my son's mother. Take her too. She's also yours. She's going to walk with you. She's going to be your intercessor. She's going to be your model. Because, of course, in the scriptures, Mary is the model of discipleship. She's the first one to believe in Christ, to treasure the coming of Christ in her heart and to be there at the cross and at Pentecost. You know, she's there. Uh, so she was the model of discipleship. So, you know, we've always had this great veneration in of Mary. And in Mexico, it's to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I don't know how I can possibly say, even in 14 hours, why there's such devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe. A friend of mine, Jeanette Rodriguez, who wrote a book on Guadalupe, she once was doing interviews at the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And she was asking people, why is Guadalupe so important to Mexicans? And there was this old lady, indigenous looking lady, uh, who was actually had a little cup and was clanging, asking for coins as people walked into the Basilica. So she decided, my friend decided to ask her. Why is Guadalupe so important above all the images of Mary in Mexico? And the old lady said, se quedó, because she stayed, because she stayed. She's always been with us in the good and the bad and the suffering and the evil and the hope. She's been constant to us. She's ever faithful. This came home to me. I guess I could try to, to communicate this through a story. Um, years ago, I went for the first time to the cathedral in San Antonio, where later I was married, uh, San Fernando Cathedral. It's the oldest cathedral sanctuary in the United States of any religion. Uh, it's been a Spanish-speaking Catholic parish since before the Declaration of Independence. Beautiful place. Uh, you should give this to your listeners for homework. They need to go to San Antonio and go to that cathedral. It's a beautiful place to, to, to pray. Well, uh, the first time I got to go to the Serenata, the serenade to Our Lady of Guadalupe, the night before her feast day, December the 11th, feast is December 12th, this is December 11th, so the singers come, uh, secular singers, all kinds of, and they all sing a love song to Mary because Mary of Guadalupe is our mother. And in that celebration, they also do a reenactment of her apparitions. She appeared to this poor Indian named Juan Diego. He's now Saint Juan Diego. Uh, she tells him to go to the bishop, and tell the bishop to build a, a, a hermitage, a chapel for her on the hill of Tepeyac. At first, the bishop doesn't believe, you know, the, the Virgin Mary really appeared to this guy, Juan Diego, and there's several back and forth until finally uh, he takes her, she tells him, take him the roses at the top of the hill. And it's December. There shouldn't be any roses growing, but there are kind of miraculously. And he takes them in his tilma, his, his Indian cloak, and he holds his hands and he goes to the bishop and says, I have the miraculous sign you requested. And as the story goes, when he drops the roses from his tilma, the image of Guadalupe appears on his cloak, on his tilma. And according to tradition, that's what's still hanging in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City today. So this is the founding story of the Mexican people. Everybody in Mexico knows the story. If you're Catholic, if you're Protestant, if you're atheist, you're all Guadalupanos. Everybody loves Guadalupe. So they, they reenact this in the Serenata. And I was sitting there. It's very beautiful. It's just, you know, young people and some others from the parish are acting this out and dramatically presenting it. And at the end of it, he drops the roses. And the bishop has been sitting on his throne the whole time, receiving him as, a, as an inferior kind of a guest. And when he drops the roses for the first time in the entire presentation, the entire drama, Juan Diego stands up. He's an indigenous man. He stands up strong and tall because he has to spread his arms to look down and see the image that's appeared on his tilma. And now the bishop kneels before Our Lady of Guadalupe and the priest, his assistants. They kneel before Our Lady of Guadalupe and say, oh, it's a miracle. But in kneeling before Our Lady of Guadalupe, they also kneel before Juan Diego, the indigenous man. And when that happened that night when I was at that cathedral, the cathedral, of course, everybody knows the story already, but still, the cathedral burst into this prolonged applause. And I got the distinct, the distinct sense immediately, they're not just applauding for the people who just acted this out. This is saying something, and I'm looking around me, and there's people in guayaberas and tuxedos and well-dressed and everyday workers in blue jeans and flannel shirts. I mean, the whole mix of people is there, and they're all applauding, and, and some even weeping, you know. And I've been thinking about that experience for the last 30 years. And that's what I write books about when I write about Guadalupe. 
why do those people clap so much? Because in many ways, I say, this is my interpretation, what they saw was the story of America, the story of the forgotten people, the put down people, indigenous people, Aztecs in this case, but not just them, any person of any background, any race, any gender that's been put down, forgotten, and has been told they don't count and has not been believed. That story is the story about how those are the people to who the Virgin Mary and her son, Jesus Christ, that image of Mary Guadalupe is pregnant. So Mary, Jesus is already within her. Those are the place where the gospel starts. God loves everybody. Jesus came for everybody, but he started in Galilee. He went out among the most rejected of the world in which he was born. Guadalupe starts out with Juan Diego, not in the center of power, on a hill outside of town where the indigenous used to worship, appearing to a poor neophyte who was just recently baptized. God breaks into history. Jesus breaks into history. Our Virgin Mother comes to us, beginning with the forgotten. And the Guadalupe story is the story of the final vindication of the forgotten. In the eyes of this world, there are certain peoples that don't count, or they don't count as much, or they're seen as nobodies. In God's world, what the world rejects, God chooses as God's very own. And that's the story of Guadalupe. It's the story of Guadalupe's appearance to Juan Diego, but Austin, the miracle of it is not whether or not Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego and what really happened. The miracle is a miracle, but it's been repeated one million, millions and millions of more times over because she comes to poor immigrants, to poor struggling people, to young people, to all kinds of people, to non-Mexican people. She's been coming to them for 500 years now saying, I don't care what you've been told. You matter to me. You matter to my son. And we're going to start something new here. And that's the story of Guadalupe that keeps getting told over and over again. And it is a miracle because it's a miracle that confronts, challenges and overturns the racism, the hatred, the stupidity of the world we live in. Um, and that's why people love her so much, because she loves them. Wow. What a powerful story there. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And yeah. That I think people will really latch on to. I, I really enjoyed that personally. To see that not just as an image of a one-off thing that happened in the past, but of something that kind of illustrates um, something so much bigger, uh, the story uh, of humanity even. And thank you for that. That was just a joy. You know, this whole interview has been such a, a privilege and a joy for me. I really appreciate your time. I, I want to respect that. And so I'll, I'll leave the question of, of how do we go forward from here for people to check out in your books because you have uh, some, some commentary on that. And I, I don't want to uh, keep you over time here, but I do want to kind of close uh, with what we do here on the channel called The Final Four, uh, which are just kind of rapid fire questions to get to know the guest on a bit of a just more personal level. Um, a lot of the conversations here tend to be a bit up in the head and kind of move it down into the heart a bit, although that, that ended on such a beautiful note, is, which is another mm -hmm. reason I wouldn't, wouldn't dare ask a, a different question after that. But uh, so to conclude uh, with these questions, the first question is, what has been the most uh, fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? For me, it, it, as a Catholic, it's the it's the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. It's the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And on the devotional side, it's Our Lady of Guadalupe. All right. Outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? My mentor wrote a book called Galilean Journey, mm -hmm. which examines the fact that when God became human, he didn't become a generic human being. He became a very specific human being at a time and a place. So the book is about what difference does it make from a Latino perspective that God wasn't born anywhere. God became a rejected Galilean in the first century. I mm -hmm. recommend the book highly. I'll have to check that out. That sounds fascinating. All right, you're having coffee with your undergrad or early grad school self. What's one piece of advice you give him for his future in theology? Well, for a young person studying theology, I would say, Stay connected to the daily life of the people, the pastoral life of the church. Don't mm. make the academy your only home. Love that. What a, what a great word there. All right. 
Last question, this channel is called Gospel Simplicity, and it's often pointed out that the conversations here can be a bit on the complex side, leading some to ask, will I change it to Gospel Complexity? To which I answer with a resounding never. But uh, in a, a sentence or so, what is the Gospel? The Gospel is God sent God's only Son to live and die and rise so that nobody on this earth will ever be able to, to, to know or to think that I'm alone and no one loves me. Mm. Wonderful. Dr. Madavina, thank you again so much for your time today. Thanks to all of you who watch this sometime in the future for your time as well. I do not take that lightly. I want to encourage you until next time, be on the lookout for more videos, but far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. Mm -hmm.